Scripture reading this evening is from John <clears throat> chapter 19, verses 23 through 30. John 19, 23 through 30. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And, and from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it, on, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Good evening. Good to see you again. Glad you're able to be out tonight. As we had made mention earlier today, we have a lot of people, several that are sick, a good number that are out of town, but uh, we're always appreciative to be able to come back together. I think most of you have probably heard various lessons through the years that deal with the final words of Jesus from the cross of Calvary. Uh, often this has been identified as the uh, seven statements or utterances of Jesus from the cross as recorded within the Gospels. And I just want to quickly go over those seven utterances of these final words. And when we look at this, and most of the commentators and scholars have kind of put these in a particular order, that does seem to make sense. Uh, some obviously that a couple of the statements that are at the very end, some are a little bit subjective to perhaps when he had said these and what specific order. But one thing that I found interesting and kind of some traditional thought that deals with this, that not only do we see in the statements of Jesus, but there are some very, very important uh, principles that can be attached with these statements. Jesus had not been on the cross very long, it would appear. And with all that was going on, and his beaten condition, and people hailing insults at him. And as he looks upon a group of people and understands what he has, we see in the tender words of forgiveness, a forgiving heart that Christ has, the very first utterance that he offers is found in the Luke account only. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. We also know that salvation certainly was uh, something that was offered and that only he could offer. It's why he was being sacrificed. But in the interesting discourse that takes place between Jesus and the thief on the cross, the one thief who acknowledges that Jesus is somebody very special. And while the other, the other thief on the other side of the cross had said some very derogatory and negative things about Jesus and even challenging him, that if you are truly the Son of God, get us down from here. But the one thief acknowledged that those thieves were there because they were thieves. They were criminals. And they were deserving of death. But he asked Jesus a very interesting thing. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And how is it that he would know something, this thief, would know something about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ? But it is there Jesus says to that thief, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that day when both of them had died, they indeed would be found in paradise. The third, the third statement that we have certainly deals with the relationship as it's recorded in John. John 19 and three of the utterances are found in the non-synoptic gospel of John. But it is one that deals with relationship. And that as Jesus was going away and concerned about his mother Mary, that there we see within that statement of, in verses 26 and 27 of John 19, first of all, he says, woman, behold your son. 
And when she, he said, woman, behold your son, he wasn't talking about himself, but he was talking about the disciple whom he loved, the, the apostle John who was there. Because it was John to whom John Jesus had given the responsibility of the commission to take care of Mary. And so woman, behold your son. And then he says to John, son, behold your mother. Then in a, the fourth statement where Jesus felt as a human and going in, as we can only imagine, of the agony, physical and emotional agony that he went through. And in fulfillment of the 22nd Psalm, by the way, that Jesus makes this statement and depending on the accounts, because it's found in the synoptics of Matthew 27 and Mark 15, in a Syriac version and as well as kind of a Hebrew slash Aramaic, Aramaic version, where he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was feeling the idea or the, feel, the concept of, of desertion there. And yet we know that he was really never abandoned by God per se, but we can only imagine what was going through his mind as he faced the horror of the cross and all that would take place. Then when it comes to the fifth statement in his distress, as we just had in our reading also in John 19, that he said, I thirst, I thirst. And there are a lot of interesting things that can be concluded about that, that no doubt with he was badly dehydrated, bad, with the loss of blood, an incredible amount of blood that was lost. And again, dehydrated, we can only imagine of what his mouth would have felt like, his whole being would have felt like, and the idea that, that he thirst was something that he brings out. But here we, it helps to depict the distress that was going on with Christ at that time. The sixth sentiment, which is the one we're going to highlight in a little bit, is one of triumph, that now near the end that Jesus would say it is finished, as recorded in John 19 and verse 30, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment. And, of course, the seventh utterance of Jesus from the cross, which really depicts reunion. Now that he's ready to die, because it is finished, and he's ready to die, and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And there would be a reunion. Now that he has suffered the sins for the sins of humanity while alive on the cross, now he will die, find rest in his death, and be reunited in time, certainly, with his father. As we think about this, and I want us to really consider this whole concept of it is finished. It's the sixth statement that I want us to highlight. In the three synoptic gospels, that is of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is interesting to me that all of them tell us that Jesus, just before he died, it says that he cried out with a loud voice, but those three gospels do not specify or articulate what it is he said. It just says he cried out with a loud voice. And then he had died. But yet when we come to the Gospel of John, John tells us what he said in that cry. And as we just had in a reading a moment ago, in that cry of John chapter 19 and at verse number 30, there the scripture reads, and reading from the English Standard Version, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he had said he had thirsted, and they brought him sour wine. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, which, of course, is his death. I've always found this to be a very fascinating statement. All seven of the statements, there's so much meaning and application that we can make to those, really in kind of a, in a homiletic or a sermon approach, if you will, of trying to understand the seven utterances of Jesus from the cross. But there's no doubt of the, of the, the intrigue that I find in the statement, it is finished. What does Jesus mean by that? What is it that Jesus finished? And I think that there's some things that we have to look at. That as we have a culmination of things that have been planned and prophesied and promised by God, even before the foundation of the world, God knew that he was going to send his son to a sinful world. And that the only way that man could ever achieve salvation was going to be through his son Jesus Christ. That man was not going to be able to do this on his own. Not by his own goodness or his own morality. That it is going to take, even as I try to emphasize this morning, the very divine grace of God. That salvation could only be possible through Jesus. And again, it was something that was planned, it was promised, it was prophesied over and over again in the Old Testament. There are literally hundreds of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the life of Jesus, to the ministry of Jesus, to all that he has done. 
And it is much more than just his death, though that certainly is significant and important. But there is so much more to that of what was being finished. And I think what is fascinating about this is that while Jesus says it is finished, and there are aspects of what he had come to do. He had finished, it was completed, and yet we're going to see in another way, there is still some work that was left undone, not because of Jesus, but because of how we are to react to what Jesus has done. And that's really what I want us to be thinking about as well. When he says, it was finished, it is finished, what was it that was finished? Now, I think you would look at this, and we recognize that Christ's suffering, he's now able to say, because he's ready to die, it is finished. We can hardly but imagine the pain, the suffering, the agony, the horror of the cross. When he said it is finished, there's no doubt that part of that aspect of the sacrifice of Jesus, of the totality of his suffering, was going to be culminated, was going to come to an end in that sense on the cross that is finished. It was prophesied that Christ would bear our grief and he would carry our sorrows. Though we are the ones that are deserving of death because of our sin, because of our flaws and mistakes, he was going to suffer, greatly suffer for us. That week that led up to the cross that week by itself, in all that he had to face, the rejection that he faced, the beatings that, that, he, that he took on, that as we look and we analyze how it was that he was scourged, beaten with, with these kinds of whips that would have at the end of them and these leather straps of either bits of bone or metal and that would literally rip the flesh from his body. That his face was beaten, he was pounded upon. All of this what is going on, and it makes sense that when we read a prophecy, for example, in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13 beginning, speaking about the Messiah, it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high, just as many are astonished at you. So his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. It is a prophecy that is telling us that Jesus was again beaten to a bloody pulp. And we cannot imagine, and some of the portrayals that have been done in paintings and whatnot historically do not begin to really show the horror of the cross. In fact, some of them look as though that he really hasn't been beaten upon that badly, but he was. Last week, I think it was Dennis that had asked if any of us had ever seen the movie The Passion of the Christ that was produced by Mel Gibson. And I suppose that as much as what Hollywood could do in, in a picture of something they're trying to display, and, and those that have seen it, and I'm sure that many of you have, that I think it is a pretty good depiction of what would have happened and, and what really did happen to the body of Jesus and the suffering that he went through, the physical agony and beating again that he took. While well, Isaiah 52 verse 14 points out that his visage, that's his face, his profile, his very image, marred more than any other man of the sons of men. It's the very next chapter in Isaiah 53 that says why he did it. In Isaiah 53 verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. What suffering. What physical suffering and anguish, anguish it was. And he says, it is finished. Jesus had told his disciples earlier in his ministry... In Matthew chapter 16 and at verse 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And did he suffer? He suffered greatly. The author of the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, there it says, reminding Christians to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross. He was, he was put to shame in this way. It was a shameful type of execution. So we can only imagine that after Jesus has experienced all of this, and now he knows in just a matter of moments, he is going to breathe his last breath on this earth until his resurrection. But he could say that when it came to the pain, the suffering, the physical anguish, it is finished. It is finished. But here is a paradox. His crucifixion, which is a terrible, terrible scene of cruelty. Yet, I want to ask you, can he be crucified again? And it's not that Jesus is ever going to come back to this earth and be rejected as such and be crucified again. But what do the scriptures tell us? I want you to take your Bibles, please, and turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, this is a verse I've spent some time with lately because of some questions and a few classes that I've had, and it, is, it has come up. But here understand in the context that this is written to Christians, and there are some Christians that have already reverted. They've gone back to Judaism. Some have left the faith. They have left the faith of Christ. Why? Tribulation, persecution, various reasons. But here the writer is saying in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good, word of the, uh, the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Look at that again at the end of verse 6. Since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God. I'm going to tell you once was enough, was it not? Of Jesus being crucified. No, we're not talking about a literal crucifixion on a cross. But how is it that Jesus can be crucified again? That when his people become defective and they leave the faith and they remain in that state and with that attitude, I'll tell you, it's impossible to renew them repentance as long as, as they keep that attitude and we've studied that a lot, several of us have. Look at this, understand, here's the point that he's making. When people have decided to defect and they go back, let them never think for a moment that the blood of Christ is going to do anything for them, but in fact what they're doing is they're crucifying Jesus all over again as though they are shoving the crown of thorns on his head, as though they are pounding the spikes through his hands and through his feet, and he's being crucified again. Do any one of us want to be responsible for that? There's a song we used to sing occasionally. It was in the old red book. I don't even know if it's in this book. But the title was, Shall I Crucify My Savior? And it was based upon this text. Very, very haunting, haunting passage. You remain in Hebrews, and in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29, there the writer points out that those that left the faith of Moses, those that defected or rebelled against Moses, they died. Two or three witnesses, if it was found they were guilty of rebelling against the law of Moses, that was the old law, the old law under the old, old system. And what was punishment? They were taken outside the walled city and stoned to death. But what about those that defect from Christ? That leave Christ, verse 29, of how much worse punishment? You mean punishment that's worth being stoned to death? Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? A common thing as though the blood of Jesus is just common blood and insulted the Spirit of grace. Yes, I understand that Jesus on the cross said it is finished. And in that respect, his suffering finished, yet he can be crucified again. And I'll tell you why. And, and, and what's so sad about it, and, he's not, and these passages aren't talking about the world, the world that won't even accept Jesus, and maybe some that will never become Christians. But those who know, and those who have been sanctified by the blood, those who had received the Spirit of God's grace, and yet to turn back and to leave the faith. And you know what the problem is? They have not crucified to themselves the world. Listen to Galatians 6, 14 very carefully. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. And Paul writes, God forbid 
that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know what we've got to do? We've got to love the Lord. We've got to love God. We've got to love Christ more than anything else in the world. And if we're not willing, and as Christians, I'm saying this to Christians, and I'm I'm speaking primarily to Christians, obviously, tonight, but we've got to love Christ more than anything else. And what that means, and this is the challenge to us, is that we've got to make sure that the world has been crucified to us and us to the world. You know what this tells me, too, before we move on? Don't ever think for a moment that the Lord is not a Lord and our God and our Savior Jesus is not a Savior of great emotion. I believe he is. I believe he's displayed emotion, not just leading up to the cross and in the cross, but how about seated at the right hand of God when he becomes a witness to the first Christian that is martyred, Stephen. And as Stephen is being stoned to death because of his faith and his commitment, what does Jesus do at the right hand of God? No longer sits, but he stands. Because he is a savior of emotion. It is finished. And yet, paradoxically, some are willing to let him suffer even more. It is finished? What is finished? Well, there's no doubt the law of Moses. And how we accommodatively talk about this, that the law of Moses was finished. You know, Jesus came to fulfill the law, did he not? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, what does Jesus say? He says, do not think that I've come to, what, destroy the law. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And did Jesus in his ministry, and Jesus in all that he did, did he end up fulfilling the law? Absolutely he did. The old law, the law of Moses, that Ten Commandment law, it served its purpose. It was given and intended by God to bring the Jews and the nation of Israel to the time of Christ. They were chosen. They were given a law. They were given a land. They were given prophets. And in that law of Moses, and that law of Moses was peculiar to the Jews. It wasn't for the Gentiles. Never intended to be for the Gentiles. It was for them. And it served its purpose. But now we know that Scripture speaks about how that has been fulfilled. And that he, when he did what he did, he came, when he came in to give himself, that law was fulfilled. It was finished. Two passages that really just help us to understand this. Nail it down, and no pun intended there, but showing that what was nailed to the cross. And understand, really what's been nailed to the cross is our sins. And that which separates us from God and even that which divided Gentile from Jews. But when you look, for example, in, in, in the scripture, that as we go to Ephesians chapter 2 and at verse 14, beginning, the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 2, 14, says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, that is both Jew and Gentile one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Much of the separation that exists between Jew and Gentile has so much to do with the law. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh, that is the flesh of Jesus, the enmity, that which creates an adversarial relationship, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile to God, in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, The very thing that created the enmity was put to death itself because of the death of Jesus. And verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who are far off, Gentiles, and to those who are near, most likely those Jews. But we look at this and we understand that when Jesus paid the price and he died on the the cross and he knew that now things were coming to the sin, there is going to be this huge transition that's going to take place. You flip just a couple of pages and go to Colossians chapter 2. Paul picks up the same discussion with these brethren in Colossians 2, beginning at verse 13. And he reminds them, and you being dead in your trespasses, this is Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, beginning. And you being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. I want to ask you, what requirements, handwriting requirements, is he alluding to there? Obviously to the old law and to that old economy. 
He says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he says, taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or in regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come but the substances of Christ. No doubt when Jesus came to do what he did and when he completed that, he could say it is finished. The law of Moses was finished because it had fulfilled and completed the very purpose that God sent it. Yet, how many today, how many today attempt to use the law today to justify religious practice? Who have evidently come to the conclusion that it is not finished And so they believe that in many respects, the law and principles of the law, and even some specifics of the law, are just fine and can be incorporated today. When Paul makes his statement, if you turn now to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about this exact thing. Those that were trying to incorporate principles of the old law of Moses into New Testament Christianity, those that were still going to be concerned about such things as circumcision, dietary regulations, keeping feast days and new moons, observing the Sabbath, the things of which he said were a shadow of things to come in Colossians. But now in Galatians chapter 5, he refers to that old system, the law of Moses, as being a yoke of bondage, that it entrapped or enslaved people. And he says in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. The law, in many respects, was a yoke of bondage to people. And you know why? Because nobody could keep it perfectly, and there was no real remission of sins found in the law itself. And what it did is it enslaved people. It was a yoke of bondage. Verse 2, indeed, I, Paul, say it to you, that you become, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. If you think you're going to have to keep circumcision, you better keep those dietary regulations. You better keep the Sabbath. You better keep all of that. And yet, didn't Jesus say it was finished? Verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith working through love. You ran well who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he's talking about the Judaizers that were badly, negatively influencing these brethren. Yes, it is finished, the law of Moses, and yet there are those that are trying to keep various aspects and principles of the law of Moses today. What a paradox that that is, that they would even do that. We are New Testament Christians. Because of that, then I want to suggest to you as well, that because the law was finished, therefore the law as the basis of judgment was finished also. Now it used to be, under that time, that economy, and for Israel, for the Jewish nation, the law was the basis of judgment. And there were various things that were considered as capital crime under the law, and people were stoned. There was reparation that was often made for various infractions or various transgressions of the law, of what people had to do. But now we see that the law as the basis of judgment was finished. And here's what's so interesting about the law. You see, under the law of sin and death, and Paul will refer to it as the law of sin and death when he speaks of the old law, the law of Moses, as a law of sin and death. Under the law of sin and death, sin equaled death. That was the byproduct. The soul that sins will die, Ezekiel 1820. Sin equated to death. But in Romans chapter 2 and verse 12, again, when you listen to this, here the apostle Paul says, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Now there's no doubt that Jews under the old law, that they were going to be judged by that law. But you know what? That's not the standard of judgment any longer. 
That law as a basis for judgment, it's finished, Jesus is saying. That's not the standard of judgment whatsoever. Stay in the book of Romans and go over to chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and beginning at verse 2, and here he gives a contrast between the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. Romans 8 and verse 2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now the law of sin and death is simply the soul that sins it will die. It's just that was the result. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that there is true, full forgiveness in Christ. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, that is now the law of Moses, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. I want to ask you something. How was that so perfectly fulfilled? Christ's death. If we were given ourselves as sacrifices under the law, that wouldn't have done anything. And will the blood of bulls and goats take away our sins? No. The only way that it could be fulfilled, expiated, if you will, the only way that it could be achieved was through Christ himself. And the law as a basis of judgment was finished. We are not under law, but under grace, Paul would say in, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Not under law, but under grace. The law, as the basis of judgment, was finished. This is what Jesus is saying, yet. Does that say that there will be no judgment? Will we be judged by Christ's words? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, what is finished is, yes, the law, the old law is the basis of judgment. That is finished. But understand that one day we're going to stand before 2 Corinthians 5.10, the judgment seat of Christ. And Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. Listen to it. For the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, what are we going to be judged by? Not the basis of the old law, because it's been fulfilled, it's been complete, it's been abrogated, it's been done away with, if you will. But are we going to be judged by the words of Christ? Absolutely. So never think for a moment that somehow we escape judgment in that sense. Now when we're in Christ, and we're living in Christ, and we're walking in Christ, we do escape the torment. We can't escape the torment and the punishment because Christ paid the price for us, but we've got to walk with him and in him. It is finished. You know what I find very interesting about this? In many respects, what Jesus was saying is Satan's dominance was finished. Satan is finished. Interesting, interesting verse. You turn over to Hebrews chapter 2 and look at verses 14 and 15. In Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 14, the writer says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And released those who through, through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. That's very interesting. That he himself likewise shared in the same. That through death, the death of Jesus, he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. We need to be very thankful and praise God that what Jesus did, and he could say, Satan's dominance is finished. Now what do we mean, and what does the Hebrew writer mean by that? We do not have to give in to the dominance of Satan because of the power of Christ and what he's done. But is it not still our choice to make? I find that very fascinating. 
But you know what happens? And the question is yet, do we let Satan back into our lives? In a passage we've talked about in Bible class, using sermons all the time, it's a passage you're very familiar with, and it's in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And we know that when Peter warns Christians in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now we understand that death, this puts an end to Satan's dominance, and yet what happens? How is it that he walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour? And I thought about this a lot, and the other day it finally came to me, you know what we do is we let him out of his cage. We let him out of his cage, this roaring lion. Satan can't make us do anything, can he? But we allow him to become proactive in our lives, sadly. When we let him out of his cage. No wonder James said in James chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. I, I tell you what. We, we either want to leave him in the cage. Or we want to live in such a way. That we submit to God. We totally submit. We give ourselves to God. And if we submit to God. And we resist the devil. What will the devil do? Flee from us. And that's what we want him to do. We want him to go a different direction than from where we are. Don't allow Satan into your life. Jesus came and died, well, to finish him off, if you will. And then finally, it is finished. What Jesus did and the purpose for his coming to begin with so as that the wrath of God against sin could be finished. The human problem of sin had to be fixed. That which began in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And as we chronicle the events of the Bible, the problem of sin had to be corrected, it had to be fixed. Because there's going to be the wrath of God against sin. And the only way that that could be satisfied was through the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. And now he could say it is finished. The Bible tells us, for example, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, that Christ tasted death for everyone. Listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 beginning, But we see Jesus who has made a little lower than the angels for the sufferings of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Taste there means he experienced it. He imbibed it. He took it in. He tasted death. It's a very idiomatic expression, Hebrewism, if you will, that it, he, is that he experienced death for us. He is not the one that should have been on the cross. We should be on the cross. But he tasted death for us, verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom, all, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. He did this for us. He tasted death for me. He tasted death for you. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul ends this section by saying, For he, that is God, made him Christ, who knew no sin. He didn't know sin. He had no relationship with sin. He had never committed a sin. But he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want us to think about the real sacrifice here. The real sacrifice that why our forgiveness, our redemption is even possible. Now, we often talk about the horror of the cross and the physical pain and the anguish of the cross. His beatings, the scourging, all of the beatings that he took and being nailed to a cross. And again, that picture that is depicted so well in the gospel accounts. And yet what I find fascinating about all of this, that he became sin for us. And as I talked about in this morning's lesson, Will God have any fellowship? Will God have any partnership with darkness and with sin? No. But when Jesus was upon the cross alive, while he's alive on the cross, 
And he's taking upon himself, suspended between heaven and earth on a cross, and taking upon himself the sins of all humanity. I don't believe that it was some kind of cosmic coincidence that darkness was upon the face of the earth for three hours. That there was a darkness that pervaded the land. That yes, in his distress and even in his feeling of rejection, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very feelings that he had. But as he was taking upon himself the sins of humanity, could God be in fellowship with him while he had sin on him? No. For the first time in what we might refer to as eternal, eternal history, pre-eternal history and so forth, nowhere do we ever see in Scripture that Jesus had ever been out of fellowship with God, not in fellowship with His Father, the Father and the Son. But here He takes upon Himself and He experiences, He experiences a bit of hell on the cross for us. And having done that, he could say it is finished. You know, when he was in the garden praying, and three times he prayed that this cup of suffering might pass, and he'd always said, not my will, but your will be done. I don't believe that he was just praying to the Father that he wouldn't have to go through physical pain and suffering. There's a lot of people who've gone through this kind of suffering, horror, Horrific things. People that have died for the countries, for their family. People have done things and have been, who have been tortured. And there's physical pain. Terrible, excruciating physical pain. But when he says that his, his, his sweated as droplets of blood, that in agony he prays. I'll tell you, I'm of the notion that what he knew that he was going to experience... It far transcends just physical pain and agony. And it is not even the death, because you know what death was? Death was relief. When he died, it was over. No pain, no sorrow, no suffering. Paradise. But on the cross and taking on sins of the world, he did not the human part of him, even maybe the divine part of him, knowing what that would be. If there's any other way, let it be done, but not my will, your will be done. And that is the love of our Savior Christ. And having done that, he could say it is finished. Yet, while this wrath of God against sin was accomplished through Christ, and he could say it is finished, is it possible for the child of God, for the Christian, to be entangled in sin again? Yes. The last passage in 2 Peter chapter 2. The Apostle Peter writes to Christians with this warning in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. For if after, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the latter end as worse for them than the beginning. For it would be, had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them, but as it has happened to them, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit. And a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. What a reprehensible condition that is. You see, Jesus did what he did so that we would not have to experience the wrath of God against sin. And he could say it is finished. He could say, and please excuse me if I just use this plain jargon. He could say, I did it for you. It's done, guys. I've done it. The wrath of God against sin. The price has been paid. Are we happy that the price has been paid? Then let us not entangle ourselves again from the very thing from which we have, that we have escaped. It is finished. What I'm saying with all of this, and you've been very patient, but I just, this has been on my heart a lot. Christ finished his eternal plan. But not all is done from the standpoint of who we are and what we are to do.
And this is where we need to come face to face with spiritual responsibility. So that one day, when we quit the walks of this life, that our own sense, not in any kind of an arrogant sense, but in our own way that we can say it is finished. Like we talked about the Apostle Paul this morning. And the Apostle Paul, he said, I fought that good fight. He says, I finished that race. He says, I've kept the faith. And we've got to be able to say and do the same. I hope that you will contemplate these words of Jesus, and I hope that all of us will apply his teachings to our lives as we should. If there's any here today that needs to come to him in loving, faithful obedience, let us know what we can do to help you, to assist you. If you're ready to make that confession of faith, we offer you his invitation. Why don't you come at this time as we stand and sing the song that has been selected.